Hey everyone, my name is Sami Laiho and welcome to my session. This session is called How to Build Better Software for Windows. I am a Microsoft MVP for the past 11 years on the core operating system and nowadays I travel around the world teaching troubleshooting and security. And I have been an operating system specialist for more than half of my life and I used to always complain that devs don't know how to please enterprise customers. Devs are writing code that is hard to handle, hard to manage, and hard to keep secure. Now, at some point I decided that I'm going to stop complaining, and I decided that maybe I should just start to actually go and speak at the dev conferences, instead of just complaining from behind the scenes. I have been doing this for quite a long time and I have quite a strong background on operating system stuff. I'm not a dev, but I'm here to present to you the IT pros wish list. Also the 10 deadly sins of app design, as I call them. I love showing this deck and just to prove that I have some background on the operating systems. When I was speaking at Ignite, Microsoft made me use a PowerPoint template and the template had a line and the line said please fill in all your certificates. Well I put all my certificates on the floor and I started thinking how am I going to put all this on one line but I came up with a great idea. So I actually weigh them. I have 1.2 kilos of certificates that fits on one line just perfect. Now about the uh, way of reaching me the easiest I'm most active on Twitter I have a few blogs, but mostly you can find me on Twitter. So please follow me at Sami Laiho. I will have some more links for you at the end of the session if you want to follow along with my video on demand stuff. So 10 deadly sins of app design. First of all, there is a book for this. It's technically not a book, but it's kind of a manual. It's kind of a document. It's on the Microsoft website. Here's a link for you to a document that tells you how to build correct Windows desktop applications. It's a very short list. And I always say that if devs would read this, it's like four pages to read. If devs would read this, we would have no problems with security and we would have applications that enterprise admins simply love. So go and read that. Some of the stuff from here, some of the stuff from my own experience during the next 15 minutes or so. So, enjoy the ride. First of all, number one, wrong use of file system. There is a very old rule in code development, which is that you should not co-locate binary and data. Windows has different locations for binary, different locations for data. Because when we have log files, for example, users generally need to be able to write to the log files, but the users are not allowed to write on top of the binaries, of course. This has gotten a little bit more difficult since Windows Vista and I get a lot of questions of where should that application data then actually be located, where should we put that log data. One thing that changed heavily with Windows Vista was that Microsoft introduced mandatory integrity control. It's a new security control on top of the privilege control and the permissions control. And normally when you have a process that tries to write to a resource, it has to go through share permissions, it has to go through NTFS permissions, and now it also needs to go through what's known as mandatory integrity control. These integrity levels were introduced to give you the possibility of saying that certain code is less or more dangerous, and certain resources on your hard disk are more or less critical. So the process is, if you think about an admin running Internet Explorer or Edge or Chrome or Firefox or whatever, Outlook, Adobe Reader, running that as admin is way more dangerous than just running Notepad as admin. But before Vista, there was no way of saying that a certain application would be more dangerous than another. So this was introduced in Vista. And now processes can have an integrity level. Four of them that we can manage from the user interface a little bit more actually if you do it from the code. So we have things that are running as system, high, medium, and low. And then we have resources that run as system, high, medium, and low. These actually explain a lot of the things that happen in Windows, but Microsoft just doesn't take usually any time to explain this. So when we take this into account as well, we get to the rules here. So first of all, binary goes to C program files if it's 64-bit. 
And if it is 32-bit, it goes to C program files x86. Okay? It does not go to C temp. It does not go to C app 1. It does absolutely not go to the user's profile. Putting binary into the user's profile gives developers an easy way of installing stuff without admin rights, but that's against every rule in the book when it comes to enterprise management. Then the data, it goes to all users, meaning if it's all users shared data, then it goes to C program data. And if it is a user specific data, then it goes to the user's profile under app data. And there you have a few options, okay? Roaming, if that data needs to roam with a roaming profile. Local or local low, if it will not roam with the roaming profile. And the separation between low and, I mean, local and local low is based on the integrity levels. So low, low integrity stuff goes into app data local low, like your browser temporary internet files. That's like the biggest garbage bin of Windows, okay? So that's also the reason why you have local and local low, it's the integrity levels. If you've ever tried dragging and dropping files into command prompt, you've seen that that used to work well before Vista and now it doesn't work as well. Well, you can actually drag things from your explorer to a non-elevated command prompt because they're on the same integrity level. But if you try to drag from an explorer, which is medium, to your elevated admin prompt, which is high integrity, that will not work. So that does apply writing from a process to another as well. And as I said, it explains a lot of things of how Windows works. Now, second one is the wrong use of registry. The registry has different locations for different kinds of data. So computer-wide stuff goes to HK local machine software. User-specific user goes to HK current user software. You do not put stuff in the HK local machine system unless it is something that is required for your Windows to boot. So the rule goes, HK local machine software for only things that are not required for your computer to boot and HK local, HK local machine system for things that are required for your computer to boot. Wrong use of services. Local service, network service, system. We have three different service accounts that you can use. System belongs to the local administrators group, is the real root account of Windows, not administrator like most believe. And when it talks outside of the box, it uses the computer account. Then we have network service locally only belongs to the limited users, but talks outside with the same computer account. And then we have the local service that locally is just a limited user and uses a null connection, null session when talking outside of the computer. So we have like one that is powerful locally, powerful network, one that is weak locally, powerful network, one that is weak locally, weak network. Now, if this does not suit your needs, then many times people start adding custom service accounts. Don't, we hate them, okay? Because we have to manage those passwords unless we can use group managed service accounts and stuff like that in Active Directory, but we hate these, okay? People should remember that since Windows Vista, all services are security principles, which means that services can actually also get permissions, okay? So let me just show you an example of this. Here's my uh, class I'm just teaching here and I'm just gonna choose properties from here, security, edit, add. And now nt service backslash spooler, for example, and this gives you the ability to give spooler or deny spooler permissions without adding a separate user account for it. You need to use the real name of the service, but it will be the same on every machine. So it's actually calculated from the name. It's not a computer specific set. This allows us to be more granular and also avoid those service accounts. I hear this all the time. Sammy, 
you should know that there are su just some certain things in Windows that require admin rights. And I call it bull beep. Okay? You can always develop a device driver. I know it's more tedious because you can't do it on .NET the same way because it's kernel mode code and you need to dig into C++ or C. I'm sorry to hear that. That's not my problem really. But I don't want to hear that this app needs admin rights because we're not going to give anyone admin rights. There are certain reasons why we don't do that. Okay. First of all, the book for NT3.1 back in 1993 says that in Windows there is no security if you're logging on as an admin. Also, if you look at some statistics, okay, so back in year 2015, 85% of critical vulnerabilities against the Microsoft operating system could be mitigated by removing admin rights. Today we have 1 million malware, 1 million pieces of malware found per day, which only like 95% which 95% of will only appear once. We can't do the old reactive stuff. We actually have to be proactive. We got now, last year, more than 100 vulnerabilities per month. We are going nearer and nearer that same thing with patching that we did with antivirus originally. So we have to be proactive. We have to block these proactively instead of patching everything, okay? Well, 2020, only 56% of all these vulnerabilities would not work if you were not an admin. But even more important than that, 90% of critical vulnerabilities in IE, well, IE is kind of like deprecated, so we should not talk about that. But 85% of the new Microsoft Edge with the Chromium engine, 85% of critical vulnerabilities would be mitigated and even cooler, 100% of all critical vulnerabilities in Microsoft Outlook. 95% of all malicious content comes through email or through the browser. So if we can block almost every single vulnerability from those sources by not being an admin, trust me, we're not going to give you admin rights. We're not going to accept the fact that you tell us that we need admin because of your app. So just stop doing that, okay? Case of shitometer. Well, what is shitometer? Well, shitometer means that um, I use a tool from Sys Internals called Process Monitor. Let's just launch Brockmon here. And with Brockmon, I prove my friends many times that I don't want to have admin rights. Not that I should not have it, but I honestly don't want to have it. So I'm going to start monitoring for anything that says access is denied. I'm not an admin on my machine. I haven't been one since, 19, since 2002. And what I have here is what I call the shadow meter because it will show me everything that failed. Basically, it shows me all the garbage that didn't end up on my hard disk or registry because I am limiting my own privileges by not being an admin. I have a customer with almost 30,000 computers. They have, after removing admin rights from their end users, they have 65% less reinstallations. I have a customer in Switzerland that has more than 10,000 computers and they have 75% less tickets. I have a Finnish customer with 140 devs and none of them have admin rights and everyone is happy with their work. So one thing to add, don't forget your SSDs. The less you write your SSDs, the more the longer they live. Okay. Not having an MSI, currently MSI or MSI X, those are the only things we accept for installing apps in an enterprise. Don't give us a setup.exe with different parameters. We couldn't care less. We need an MSI package that we can deliver through uh, Microsoft Endpoint Manager, also known as SCCM, or Intune. Bad uninstallers. Make sure that when you uninstall the app, it actually clears after itself. There are certain things that really mess up the operating system, and then we remove them, and they leave the mess behind. Sometimes it's even more important than some other times because, for example, when you install things like Visual Studio 2015, it installs 110,000 registry values. So it's not nice if they don't clean up properly. Okay. 
incorrect use of multimedia processes. Windows allows you to uh, choose your application to be a multimedia process. And people think it just makes your application react faster. But they also forget that it can take our battery life down. So what you can do is you can lower the timer interval of Windows from the, th from the default uh, 15.6 milliseconds down to even half a millisecond. And when Windows normally works in this calm pace and when it has some time to rest, it takes a rest, then you see an option saying, I want my app to react 15 times faster. But what they don't understand is that even without admin rights, they can actually change that value when you launch the app, but it affects the whole CPU, which means basically that after that, your CPU starts going like this. <laughs> which ends up using more energy, less time to relax, shorter battery time. So if you battery life, if you don't need that option, I get it when you have 60 frames per second video showing and you're using Excel next to it and your CPU needs to change between these two all the time. I get it. You don't want that video to look poor, but if you don't need it, like for example, Google Chrome did at some point where Google Chrome said that they are 15 times faster than IE, but they forgot to mention that even IE would be 15 times faster as long as you run Chrome in the background. That gets me slightly pissed, okay? I have a really bad case of a uh, PDF creator as well. So I have a PDF creator on my uh, computer and I had to kind of just disable it because it installs a PDF printer that takes down the timer. I have a tool called Snagit that does it as well because it captures screenshots. And I kind of get it, like you're trying to get a very fast snapshot of the, we, of the screen. So I kind of get it like that. It has to react very fast. It's like the shutter speed of a camera. In a way, I kind of get it. What about my PDF printer? I'm not trying to print paper. I'm not trying to print PDFs of flying objects. There's absolutely no reason for it to have it. But if I take it out, I have more battery life. People seem to hate uh, the modern stuff. Well, don't hate the modern stuff itself. I mean, they are in many ways way easier for us to manage because they're isolated way better. So the modern app starting with Windows 8, which then became universal apps, and now the technology is going forward with MSIX, allows us to have even more control than we had with the integrity levels. I mentioned the integrity levels, but if you get to the same level of integrity, then you don't have any borders in between, which means that Windows can't control connections from app to another or from apps to different resources. Now, we already in Vista got services to be security principles, but now we can make apps be security principles because when these app containers are used, they have SIDs, which means we can put access control in between of the apps saying that the calculator cannot talk to Angry Birds, or we can also say that only certain apps can connect to our devices. Windows is an old operating system and these need to be um, done supporting the old stuff. Windows can't break compatibility, trust me. We can still run code from 1990s without any emulation. There's a straight quote from Microsoft and it says that there is no roadmap for App V that doesn't end up in MSIX. The same goal for all the other development or the other packaging that we have, which means you should really invest in looking into MSIX. Management tools misunderstood. Do not build apps that require us to RDP into a server. RDP, since Windows 2000 is marked as a remote desktop protocol, has two sessions for every server for emergency purposes only. We don't want to do that. We want to manage everything from a privileged access workstation or from Windows Admin Center. Don't build software that needs me to log on with RDP. RDP, we say, stands for Ransomware Deployment Protocol. 
not ready for what allow listing. So allow listing meaning that we are now controlling all the binary that runs. We used to do antivirus as reactive. Now we change to things like app locker where we want to list the good things. So for that, we have quite a lot of rules. First of all, do not touch the access control lists of program files and windows. That's the biggest thing for making me hate you because it messes up the whole app locker concept and makes it insecure. Plus it's against all the rules. Don't install in the root of C, don't install in C users, C program data or something you created yourself. That binary needs to go to program files and program files x86. That means it requires admin rights to install it. Yes, it's an enterprise app. That's how we do it. All binary needs to be signed, including DLLs. Do not only do not expect us to accept only signed executables because we control DLLs as well. So we need you to sign all your binary. If you're delivering scripts, those scripts included. And of course you sign them with a trusted certificate so that we don't have to add any trusted any certificates into the trusted store. Teams and Slack were good examples of this in the beginning. They started putting things into the user's profile, which means we can't allow that location because people can change the binary. They did not sign all sign all the binary, so we didn't we couldn't do publisher rules. And they updated themselves so we couldn't use hash rules. Now, do not create binaries on the fly unless you're signing them with the same, same certificate that you used for code signing your other code. What we hate the most is you pushing an executable into the temp folder and then it disappears. Because we see it in the logs and then we can't catch it and whitelist it. Just don't do that, okay? Team Viewer did this, so that's not just that uh, small players would do this. Intel did this originally. We catch them one by one and we try to convince them to fix those issues. TeamViewer has fixed it now so that they put the log files in the program files, but they put an access control list entry on it saying deny execute. <sighs> it fixes that issue, that one issue, but it's still against all the rules. Okay, so try just make sure that you listen to the first rule I said. Always separate binary from data. I'm sorry if I insulted anyone. Use this information for good, not evil, like Mark Minassi always said. <laughs> um, it was a pleasure. If you want to see more of my stuff, here's some codes for you. Follow me on follow me on Twitter. Send me an email if you need anything. I have a so I have a few sessions on plural side and I have my own dojo where you can get free 30 day access with that code and you can subscribe to a newsletter. Thanks for having me and enjoy the rest of the show.